Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Welcome to today's webinar titled Integrating AI in Pathology, Advancing Diagnoses and Workflow Efficiency. Today's web seminar is brought to you by Diaceutics. To learn more, visit the Diaceutics booth in the exhibit hall and visit diaceutics.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We will answer as many as we have time for at the end of the presentation. I would now like to welcome our speaker for this session, Professor Sophie Privo. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the presenter window at the top of your screen. Professor Privo, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, invitation and your introduction. So uh, I, I'm Sophie Prevo, and uh, I want to thank uh, also Diastetics uh, for inviting me to present uh, our experience in our lab uh, to integrate artificial intelligence in uh, our daily workflow of pathology. I don't know if uh, there are only pathologists uh, listening and uh, uh, looking at this presentation, perhaps other one which are not very uh, used to pathology. Anyway, I, um, I'm okay. Ask any question in the ask question box during the presentation. And I, I think it would be very interesting at the, the end of it to, to try to answer and uh, go on about this subject. So um, I want briefly to present uh, our um, department. Uh, out of the six uh, university hospital group uh, in Paris, the UHG uh, Paris Sacré is located in the south of Paris here. And uh, it, uh, be, it is constituted by four uh, hospitals, Bicêtre, Paul Brousse, Antoine Beclair, and Ambroise Paré. Uh, the main building is located in uh, Bicetre and uh, it's where the Department uh, of uh, Pathology is located and it looks new because it has been uh, built in 2017-2018 uh, uh, so it is uh, six years old so it's very nice to be in such a place. How is this uh, Department of Pathology uh, organized? When we moved in that building, yeah, we made the decision not to limit the use of uh, digital pathology to uh, teaching and research, but uh, we want to go in full digital uh, for our daily practice with a gradual uh, introduction in this daily practice of new tools of uh, artificial intelligence. And by doing this at that time, it was in uh, 2018, we were the first in uh, Paris and more than that in France to choose this uh, way of practice. To do so, the department is now equipped with uh, four uh, scanners. All of them are uh, 3D stack, uh, 3D stack uh, scanners. Two are P250 for immunofluorescence and uh, research, and two are uh, broadband P1000 uh, for all the other slides and uh, including the cytology. Uh, ergonomic and uh, workstation have been uh, uh, provided and uh, today in uh, 2023 and uh, 2024, 35,000 cases per year are uh, analyzed and uh, 1,100 slides per day are produced. The storage is limited, as you can see, because it's of uh, 350 uh, tera terabytes. Uh, it's limited, and so WSI slides are automatically purged one month after validation of the reports, except those slides selected and tagged by the pathologist. So, digital pathology has been implemented and the pathologists have to get experience interpreting WSI uh, slides 
and using the workstation with the IMS uh, developed in the ABHP. We work with the IMS uh, Calopix from Tribune Health, which is integrated with the LIES uh, GAMIC from uh, Dedalus. And now we are working, wait, working at the, the practical integration of different tools of uh, artificial intelligence in our daily practice and uh, our established workflow. So here is the main point of uh, this presentation. We all know, uh, and it's presented on the left of the slide, that uh, um, AI is a revolution in health due to the ability to analyze and process large volumes of data. And uh, it's now applicable in pathology thanks to digital slides, which can be also uh, named WSI, so World Slide Images. And this application to AI is a logical outcome to digital, to digital pathology, which is absolutely not the end and end in itself. You don't do digital pathology to do digital pathology. You do digital pathology to add AI tools to your practice. So um, the different techniques of machine learning or deep learning moreover are now applied on the digital slides and uh, on the right of the slide you can see that uh, um, different types of algorithms can be considered in uh, pathology the first one are the diagnosis and quantitative algorithms which are used for screening identification of pathogens when you want to quantify we can quantify cells mitosis uh, scoring uh, uh, histopathological scoring immunolabeling scoring and uh, so on and then the third type of algorithm are predictive ai used for prognosis for molecular abnormalities as well as for uh, terranostic uh, objects why are we going to apply uh, AI in routine pathology? Uh, there is many, many answers to this question. First, we can gain uh, medical time for tedious tasks. Second, it's to improve the accuracy of uh, the diagnosis. It's a possibility to reduce the use of immunohistochemistry, to make fast and reliable quantification of biomarkers, as well as histoprognostic uh, reproducible scorings. All of these, all of these, with a medical validation by the pathologist at the end of the analysis. In case of predictive uh, algorithm, we are going to obtain additional information to the currently obtained on conventional uh, pathologic uh, analysis which defines the increased pathology with molecular abnormalities, response to targeted therapy, and so on. However, the implementation of AI in routine pathology requires numerous testing steps beforehand, and it's really numerous steps. We have to uh, look at blinded clinical validation, deployment studies, analysis of gain of time in real time work in analysis and reporting. And we have to prove the improvement of diagnosis, for example, with comparisons of results obtained by inexperienced pathologists with and without the aid of AI based on expert consensus diagnosis. This is one example of a proof that you have to get. So how to choose an AI tools in AI pathology? Assessment of medical and economic advantage in the structure has to be evaluated. Of course, the algorithm has to be FDA or CEIVDR approved. Published conception of the algorithm as well as clinical validation has to be analyzed as well as its distribution in the world. 
then integration or no integration of uh, the results in the IMS of uh, the results in the final report and the LIS are also very important. We have to keep in mind which are the supported image format before the um, diffusion of the DICOM format, which is not uh, uh, yet uh, obtained. And uh, finally, we have to be uh, very clear about the staining supported which is HE or like in French, France, I'm sorry, HES uh, staining. Here is uh, slides where are presented some examples and short lists of tools of artificial intelligence which are uh, proposed, offered in cytology, in cytology, as well as in histopathology for diagnosis, for quantitative analysis, as well as predictive analysis. It's an, not a final list, and uh, I'm sure that some uh, purpose are losing on this slide. So, how to apply AI in routine pathology? Three methods of routine uh, use of AI in uh, pathology um, are possible. The first one is uh, AI-assisted analysis in real time. Time is necessary to have confidence in the algorithm while knowing its limits. The second uh, method of routine use is to use AI in second reading as quality control as analysis by pathologists. The third one is uh, eventually uh, using the AI as an initial screening, and that would be possible in case of algorithm with excellent performances, and it could save the pathologist from reading slides considered negative for cancer, for example. I'm not sure that we are yet uh, completely ready for that third uh, situation. Two other points have to be kept in mind. Uh, first, uh, AI uh, algorithm is producing or not a report. This report is or not integrating to the final report of the pathologist. And then we have to keep in mind that we need to have a progressive learning curve, which is not so easy to get. Then here is a slide which could seem very complicated, but in fact, we are going to simplify it. Um, how to integrate the algorithm into the workflow? Ideally, the full digital configuration must be preferred. Anyway, parallel flows must have to be setted by sorting and digitalizing files to be AI analyzed, and then manual integration of the result of the EA analysis into the IMS of the lab. One of the problems of the manual integration is that you are going to have two different workflows in your lab, one with uh, digitalized slides and AI uh, analysis, and the other one with the classical glass slides. It's not so easy to conduct. Ideally, the IMS, which is in the center of this slide, the IMS should be an integrator of the AI solutions offered on the market. But so far, it's not being the case. The integration of algorithms in IMS is often not functional to date, and there is a requiring work between um, AI uh, publishers and IMS publisher. This is very important, this point of integration. The vast majority of algorithms already uh, used, as you can see on the right of the slide, are offered in a SAS uh, mode in a cloud, which is a solution which is less more expensive than uh, the use of local computer server. 
but which faces regulatory issues, especially in France, and I insist about this before. Allow to speak on it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, local computer, but we, it, it is in progress because regulatory issues in France, especially. The diagram shows the four main uh, workplaces. On the upper of the slide, the LIS, and in the middle, the IMS. On the bottom, the scanners, and on the right, the the cloud. And two operating modes can be used which are the two circles, blue circles on the right. The first one, it's the, um, all the slides of the case can be uh, registered to be all analyzed by the algorithm at the uh, registration of the case at the beginning of the workflow. And it's a case of the prostate biopsies. We will uh, speak about uh, that uh, later. And the second way, it, which is in the round blue uh, circle on the bottom, which is in case or only one or a few side, slides of the case are going to be analyzed by the AI uh, tool. And it's a case, for example, of uh, breast pathology, and I will present that uh, at the end of the presentation. There are two other points uh, where the work is unfinished and uh, to get a complete integration of AI in the workflow uh, of digital pathology of the lab. First is the problem of the security of health data. And the second point is the format of the analysis results, their integration into the final pathology report and the question of the storage. So, after this uh, presentation, I think I'm almost in time, yes. Uh, I'm going to present different topics of interest we have in our lab. As you can see, we are interested in automated quantification of epidermal nerve fibers in a certain neuropathology and uh, amyloid pathology, amyloid pathology. We are interested in automated screening of samples of colonic polyps to look for precarcinomatous and carcinomatous lesions. We are also interested in uh, uh, hepato um, carcinoma, hepatocellular carcinoma to identify, identify uh, pejorative cases. And I'm now presented just four examples of, um, of our daily practice. The first one is uh, the use of uh, the Cleo Breast uh, tool, which is produced by Prima. And uh, it is actually used in the department daily uh, on a on premise mode and uh, with manual launch of the algorithm on only a few slides uh, per each uh, selected case. It is applied in breast pathology and to look for in situ and infiltrative uh, carcinoma and then to uh, make the mitotic score of the carcinoma. Uh, on the Cleo breast uh, interface, which is uh, here presented, we can select it as shown at the bottom right, the case we want to analyze. And we know uh, the status of the analysis on the right column of uh, the um, windows, uh, working windows. I'm going to present the case, a very recent case I had to analyze uh, two weeks ago, in fact. And uh, it is uh, a case uh, where we are going to make diagnosis analysis and uh, quantitative uh, analysis, and it which is made of two different slides. When you, op um, when you open the case on Cleo Breast, uh, you have this window where the slide is in the middle. The button to uh, navigate are on the left of the slide, and on the right, you have the results of the uh, analysis. 
On the first slide, um, Cleo Brest says that there was only in situ carcinoma. It is located at the bottom of the slide and it appears on the image as a yellow heat map. And as you can see on the triangle, the yellow heat map is a sign of in situ carcinoma and it is here on the HES slide visualized. The second slide of this case has been said to be an infiltrative carcinoma uh, by uh, Cleo Breast uh, analysis. With the heat maps, the infiltrative carcinoma appears in red. And when you look on the right, there is a, a clear infiltration with the carcinomatous cells. And whatever it was used, here at the bottom, you have the immunostechemistry, which shows that there is no myoepithelial cells around the rows of uh, epithelial cells. Then Cleo Breast is able to analyze the mitosis only on the areas of infiltrative carcinoma. Here is the presentation, and uh, you have um, on the right of the slide all the mitosis objects which has been identified at pro and proposed by uh, the uh, AI uh, tool. It defines also um, hot spots of mitosis which appear on the slide as, as the round, as, as the circles uh, on the sections. And then on the right, it proposes the results of the mitotic count. And here it proposes in that case, uh, five mitotic uh, um, mitosis per millimeter square, that is a score one. It's a very uh, easy using um, uh, tool because we can uh, interact with the system. You know, as a pathologist, I don't agree with the first mitosis which appear on the right and the, the, it is the mitosis on the white square. I don't agree with it. It's shown with a green uh, arrow. And I can very easily with the tool on the left where you have the mitosis and the um, garbage uh, can, you can delete this mitosis and uh, it's very easy. So you have the mitosis and you can uh, uh, delete it and uh, it disappears on the right from the count of the mitosis. You have only yet four mitosis. On the other hand, if as a pathologist, you think you, you've seen uh, some mitosis which have been left by the algorithm, you can very easily add it. I show on the right two mitosis that I add on the, um, on the slide. In fact, I add totally three mitosis and then it appears, it appears on the right of the slide that there is now three, four, five, six, seven mitosis. Then we have in round the hotspot mitosis and the clear breast algorithm is able to deposit small square areas of 0 0.2 millimeter squares and uh, to put them as if we were looking at a microscope. And uh, there are 10 squares, so you have a surface of 2 millimeter square. And so you obtain 7 mitoses per 2 millimeter squares, and that is a score 1 in the WHO classification. What is very interesting that is that at the bottom I present the manual analysis done by the pathologist. And it is very funny, I can say, to look at, it's clearly almost the same um, area of the section that it has been studied. So that was the first example, analysis of breast carcinoma, identifying in situ carcinoma, infiltrative carcinoma, in the infiltrative carcinoma, counting the mitosis and propose hotspots and a, score, a mitotic score. The second example is the example of the tool produced by Triber Earth 
and uh, which is a quantitative uh, AI uh, analysis, analysis of AO2 uh, expression in breast infiltrative carcinoma. Uh, this uh, tool is uh, also an on-promise uh, tool, and uh, it is possible in our context, in our lab, to direct to directly uh, um, choose the analysis with uh, this tool on the right button, which is in blue on the uh, image on the right. You have a button in blue, which uh, show two analyses of two um, areas of interest, which has been drawn and where the analysis of the HER2 uh, expression has been done. Here, on a higher magnification, you can see that uh, I'm very interested about the second analysis, the one which is at the bottom, and it's on the uh, um, section which is presented with the heat maps, green and yellow, brown and red, are the four colors of the four scores of the expression of L2. And uh, you see on the higher magnification that there were squares of R2 um, expression. And because of the percentage of the expression, this case has been uh, said as being a 2 plus R2 expression. Um, I can present here another case. It's a different case of breast carcinoma. It's also um, breast biopsy. And on this breast biopsy with the same uh, L2AI analysis, uh, we identify and uh, the um, algorithm identify uh, two different areas. When one, sorry, one with an L2, uh, two plus expression of uh, R2, which is on in situ hybridization the technique clearly amplified and another uh, area which is mostly R2 one plus expressed and in which area, in that area in situ hybridization show a non-amplified gene, gene expression. So that is the second uh, example. The third one, the third one is um, the case of uh, AI analysis in prostate carcinoma, and it is the presentation of an algorithm, algorithm proposed by Euphoria, which name is Euphoria Clinical AI Model for Prostate Cancer. We are now testing it uh, as a cloud-based solution in a pro program which is going to List uh, for two years, and uh, we are working. We are working on it as well as San Louis Hospital, which is located in the north of Paris. The diagnosis of prostate carcinoma is the example of a tedious and time-consuming uh, task, uh, which could be facilitated by the automatically use of AI analysis on all slides when registering the file on the LIS. In each file of prostate carcinoma, 12 mapping biopsies are made by the clinician and they are completed by targeted biopsies. Here, in that case, there are two targeted biopsies. They are drawn on the small uh, drawing uh, in the middle of the slide. And uh, it could be uh, completed by immunohistochemistry uh, studies. And in that case, pathologists have uh, done immunohistochemistry in, on four biopsies. Then uh, the um, um, uh, final uh, report, uh, which presents the analysis of each biopsy and the synthesis of the analysis of all these biopsies. Actually, um, the AI uh, solution um, is done uh, uh, is manually driven, but in October it would be uh, fully integrated. So, uh, IFORIA uh, Windows 
propose us a working list, just as a Cleo Brest uh, uh, tool from Prima. And uh, we can choose uh, to class uh, the different case by priority as a concern, not concern, and things like that. Um, things like that, I'm sorry. There is some, uh, uh, some on my desk, but it doesn't matter. And uh, we can uh, open the different cases and we can have the uh, reporting results of all the slides analysis. It's a very um, uh, easy uh, um, algorithm because it's uh, flexible and uh, it pathologists have the possibility to interact with it. Uh, all the terms uh, necessary to the results are presented. The total length of the biopsies, the total length of the areas of carcinoma, the different uh, uh, score of gleasons in the uh, territory in the areas of adenocarcinoma, as well as adverse uh, findings uh, items. When the pathologist doesn't agree uh, with the proposed uh, results obtained on each side, it, could, it is very easy for him to use the tools which has on the upper uh, slide uh, on the left to modify the areas of analysis and modify the area of uh, Gleason 3 or Gleason 4. And these modifications are automatically and very quickly integrated to the final results of the analysis. And at the end, the uh, tool, the AI tool, produce a final result which uh, could be uh, directly uh, exported to the LIS and the final report of the pathologist. Fourth and last uh, example of the presentation on our uh, use of AI in our practice uh, daily uh, of pathology and work. It's um, breast carcinoma and uh, re um, another uh, algorithm, which is a predictive algorithm, which is proposed by uh, Okin and in, which is uh, on premise in our lab. Uh, in case of breast early carcinoma, it is important to define as precisely as possible if uh, the um, which is the risk of recurrence of the breast carcinoma after surgery in order to propose the best uh, therapeutic de-escalation that does not call into question the progression of the disease. The, on, on our virtual tray, which is here presented, we have the macroscopic views of the surgical specimen. We have the slides of the sampling of this specimen. And we have also the uh, immunohistochemistry slide, which has been done according to this uh, breast cast infiltrative carcinoma. In case of uh, estrogen uh, positive and R2 uh, negative infiltrative carcinoma, it, the pathology can select, as it's uh, shown, on the first image on the top of the slide, he can select one slide of the carcinoma, and uh, on the right, he press on the um, button of uh, image analysis, choose to make the analysis on the under slide of uh, the um, of the of the case, and the result is obtained in one minute. The result appear uh, on the window of uh, lecture and at the end of the virtual trail as a um, PDF uh, report when, where is expressed the, the expression of the high or low risk of the carcinoma. 
to show that, I hope it will be okay. Uh, I could present this uh, small uh, video. Professor Privo, so sorry to interrupt. We're actually unable to hear your audio. So let's actually wait until this. It looks like this video is concluding now. So uh, one tell me that you couldn't uh, listen to me when I was uh, uh, presenting the video. I'm sorry of that. And uh, here is my last slide of this uh, presentation of relapse risk BC produced by Oki. The problem is in case of early breast carcinoma, ER positive and ER2 uh, negative, do we have to, pro to propose adjuvant chemotherapy or not to the patient? How nowadays we have uh, some uh, tools just here on the left upper slide slide where we can uh, use clinical criteria and anatomopathological criteria to obtain to obtain an evaluation of the low risk of recurrence or the high risk of recurrence in some cases during the um, uh, weekly uh, multidisciplinary consulting meeting uh, we have to it is decided to um, add some molecular uh, analysis to obtain molecular criteria and obtain a better stratification between low and high risk for this breast carcinoma. And it's here an example of such a test on the bottom left of the slide with an endopredict test which uh, proposed a high uh, risk of uh, recidive of this carcinoma. And now what is proposed with the relapse risk BC uh, from Okin is to obtain from just one HES slide of this infiltrative carcinoma to have an analysis, an IA uh, an analysis, and to obtain a result of stratification as a low or high risk. And in that case, um, the relapse risk BC uh, tool had also defined a uh, high risk of relapse um, at uh, five years of evolution of uh, the, the disease. And uh, now this, um, we have this uh, um, algorithm proposed at, uh, in this alpha version, but uh, in October we will test the beta version in which some clinical criteria will be associated with the relapse risk analysis of the slide, which are the age of the patient, the size of the tumor, and the number of metastatic lymph nodes. So finally, I hope that I have convinced you of the possibility and the necessity, more or less, of implementation of AI in digital pathology uh, workflow. This uh, implementation, you have to keep that in mind, is not an easy process and many months of work are still necessary to resolve some of the tasks that present themselves to us uh, as we progress. But anyway, we will do it and we will continue. Joint work must be uh, done between MIS publishers, LIS publishers, and AI publishers to integrate the final reports of uh, the AI analysis. And there is oh, two important obstacles. The first one is financial. The first one is financial, and it is the economic model of AI pathology. 
integration and usage costs registration as a novel act in the French nomenclature, but we have to keep in mind that the economic model of digitized slides is not yet uh, done in France anyway. The second point is that, at least in France, the regulatory obstacles which are very important. We have to make the information of the, in, of the patient uh, each time we use RA uh, in the diagnosis of the disease. There is the problem of the um, health data uh, hosting and then the question of the sovereign or non-sovereign clouds, uh, which is really a problem nowadays in France. But we hope it would be so, as soon as possible resolved. And then the last step of the process, which is here on the right of the slide, is the uh, integration, integration of a multiple model data integration and clinical decision for uh, real personal medicine. So I want to thank all the people who work in this lab, uh, because without them it would have been impossible to do all of that as well as the medical team, the technicians, and of course, the information department. And uh, I am now ready for questions, if you have some, uh, or if you have some uh, uh, more details to present. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Professor Privo, for your informative presentation. We will now jump into the live Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, as a reminder, if you have a question that you would like to submit, go ahead and submit it in the box located to the far left of your screen. We will answer as many as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. It looks like we have a few available already. So here is the first, Professor Privo. In the perspective of the evolution of pathology in the next few years, do you think that tools of AI as a help to the practice of pathology for a better reproductibility and diagnosis accuracy will therefore allow even a more personalized patient care? Um, thank you. With this question, I hope that my presentation clearly uh, answered to this question. Uh, especially the last uh, slide of my presentation, I do really uh, think that uh, it's the case. And uh, it's the main point of this uh, revolution is to allow a more personalized uh, care of the patient. And uh, with the first point, which is a more reproductible and uh, accuracy diagnosis and results. I think that really. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, here's another. This one says, how do you consider the use of AI tools in pathology? Systematic, only in cer certain circumstances? Ah, oh, yes. Um, I think uh, we can't give uh, um, just one answer to this. It depends on the cases. Um, in case of prostate biopsies that I show you uh, during this presentation, I think we have to use AI uh, systematically because it helps all the work of diagnosis of the pathologist and really it would be a great uh, help in terms of time, in terms of uh, accuracy of the diagnosis and I'm sure of the um, uh, lower uh, use of uh, immunohistochemistry. So I think that this is an example of an uh, automatically used and systematically used of AI. On the other hand, there is a case of AI tools which, has, which are quantitative tools. And for example, in breast pathology, we have to do immunohistochemistry for uh, estrogen receptors, prostate receptors, and key uh, 67 marker. And we have to uh, give the results as a percentage. 
but every pathologist knows that in some cases almost all the slides are positive and we don't need any help of AI. We saw the slide and we know it's a very strong positivity, 100% of the cells. We don't need any help, any uh, aid of AI. But when we are in the case of the expression, not so far from the um, not so far from the positive uh, threshold, then in that case, it's very important, I think, to have the tool and then to make the analysis to be sure that you are low uh, mitotic activity or high mitotic activity, for example, in case of T67. So it depends on the solution. But I think that there is one thing very important that we have to keep in mind. Pathologists and AI publishers have to speak together to define as well as possible the fair rules to use AI in pathology. It's a very important point, I think. All right, wonderful. Thank you. It looks like we have one more here, so we will go ahead and wrap up with this. Looking back the past years, what is the main difficulty encountered in implementing digital pathology and AI in your daily practice? Oh. It's not so easy to 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 answer to this question, uh, especially because uh, I'm sure that AI is very important. But anyway, what is the most? Uh, I could say that uh, uh, the first point, I think it would be much more easier if your lab is 100% digitalized, because in that case you have only one workflow of work and you can add as many as uh, you want AI tools on your uh, workflow of pathology. So I think that it is very a very important point. And um, the second point, which is really, which has been really a difficulty for I, is that in fact, as pathologists, we don't know very well um, how deeply these tools will modify our way to work. It is going to change our uh, use of um, work on digital pathology, anywhere on digital pathology or on the microscope. And it is only using AI tools that we are going to learn how to modify your way, our way to work and we have to be able to accept this modification of working and it, sometimes it's not so easy for pathologists so Perfect. i think these are the two points thank you so much thank you again professor privo for your time today and for your impo important focus on this area of precision medicine we would also like to thank our sponsor, Diasutics, for underwriting today's webcast. Before we go, I would like to thank the audience for joining today. And as a reminder, this webinar can be viewed on demand. We will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye.